That concludes general questions. We'll turn now to First Minister's questions, and we start with number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this year, I challenged the First Minister over the shrinking number of subjects that Scottish pu school pupils can take. And in reply, she said this, we will continue to work hard with local authorities and with schools to ensure that our young people have the broadest and widest possible choice. So can I ask the First Minister, what progress has she made in achieving this? First Minister. We continue to ensure that pupils have the widest possible choice. Of course, uh, the system has changed over the last few years. So uh, we now assess the qualifications of young people at the stage they leave school. And when we look at pupil attainment uh, at the point pupils leave school, we find two things I would hope Ruth Davidson and everybody else across this chamber would welcome. Firstly, we find that attainment overall is up in Scotland. And secondly, we find that the gap between the richest and the poorest is narrowing. Uh, that's what matters, and that's where real progress is being made. Ruth Davidson. I'm not sure that was much of a progress report on school choice, so let's take the progress that was presented to this parliament yesterday. Professor Jim Scott appeared before the Education Committee, uh, and he talked of the staggering drop in subject choice that we're seeing in our schools following the introduction of curriculum for excellence. Now, more than half of Scottish schools restrict pupils to just six exam courses in S4. And here's the impact. Over the last five years, these restricted choices brought in under this SNP government have cost Scottish pupils 622,000 qualifications. That's 622,000 courses that would have been sat but never were. Now, Order, Professor please. Scott, who is a former head of 18 years standing, so those shouting from a sedentary position might want to listen to what he had to say yesterday, he said this, I actually struggle to say that in a public forum. It is almost unbelievable. I think so too. What does the First Minister make of it? First Minister. I, I think it's entirely unbelievable, actually. Um, unfortunately for Ruth Davidson, I've looked rather closely uh, and with interest at Professor Scott's research. Uh, and the problem is when you try to compare the old and the new systems, it's a bit like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, Professor Scott, and it, it might do Ruth Davidson well to, to listen to some of this. Professor Scott focused on awards below higher level. That's essentially looking at what pupils achieve by the time they finish S4. But you know, the days of large numbers of pupils leaving school at S4 are long gone. The overwhelming majority Absolutely. stay on to S5 and S6. So we focus on the awards pupils achieve by the time they leave school. For a young person, that's what matters to their chances of getting an apprenticeship, a college place, a university place, or a job. And when you look at that, we see attainment overall is up uh, and the gap between the richest and the poorest is narrow. So here's some figures uh, for Ruth Davidson to chew over. Uh, the proportion of pupils getting passes at higher level has risen more than 10 percentage points. It was 50.4% uh, 50 in 2009-10. In 2016-17, it was 61.2%. When we look at National 5 level, the proportion leaving school with an award has risen 9 percentage points. It was 77.1% in 2009-10. It was 86.1% in 2016-17. Uh, 17. And at higher level, the gap between the rich and the poorest has fallen by almost seven percentage points. And here's one uh, last statistic that I think should interest people uh, right across this chamber. It comes from Maureen McKenna, the Director of Education in Glasgow. She points out that in Drumchapel High School, uh, I think recognised as one of our more deprived areas, in 2006, 8% of pupils achieved one or more higher by the end of S5. In 2018, that was 53%. 8% to 53%. You know, I think it's about time. Ruth Davidson stopped talking our schools down and started celebrating the achievements of pupils right across this country. Ruth Davidson. I can tell the First Minister doesn't want to talk about that 622,000 figure. In fact, she'd rather talk about anything else. And I think I heard her at the beginning as she was rising saying that she didn't believe it. But let me go back to the actual transcript that was presented to the committee yesterday. 
If things had gone on as they were in 2013, we would have had an extra 622,000 qualifications in Scotland in the five years since. That is the analysis. And it's not just about those 622,000 qualifications that were lost. It is also about the drop in subject choice and where it's hitting pupils the hardest. So let's talk about schools in deprived areas, shall we? Because the schools which are most likely to drop down to as few as five subjects in S4, leaving pupils with little room to pursue a rounded education, are in these deprived areas. Let's listen to Dr Marina Shapira of Stirling University, who also gave evidence yesterday. She said, yet yeah, this, the reduction in subject choice is larger in schools in higher areas of deprivation, and the reduction is larger in schools where there are more children on free school meals. If we're going to sort the problem, we need to accept the evidence. Will the First Minister accept the evidence from Dr Marina Shapiro? Well, First Minister. Let me offer some more evidence from the Director of Education in Glasgow City Council. She said, and she said it just this week, in 2008, just 5% achieved five or more hires by the end of S5. In 2018, that had increased to what she described as an incredible 13.4%, an increase of 178%. She points uh, to another school in Glasgow, St Thomas Aquinas Secondary School, uh, where in 2006, 29% uh, achieved uh, more than one higher by the end of S5. In 2018, that was up to 65%. Wow. So all of the statistics are pointing in the same direction. And I'm not sure if Ruth Davidson is standing here today saying that somehow that doesn't matter. The proportion of pupils getting passes at higher level, just let me repeat, has risen by more than 10 percentage points. Uh, it's risen by nine percentage points for those getting uh, a qualification at National 5 uh, level. We also see over 50,000 skill-based qualifications, yep. awards and certificates have been achieved this year, which incidentally is double the figure of yep. skill-based qualifications that were achieved in 2012. Uh, and just for added measure, uh, presiding officer, talking about closing the attainment gap, uh, just this morning, UCAS has released new data showing that Scotland has hit another new record for the number of young people getting a university place. So let's start celebrating that success. Uh, and lastly, presiding officer, uh, I don't think the Tories have got a shred of credibility on education left after the U-turn they did yesterday voting to scrap primary one assessments that they have spent the last four years demanding that this Scottish Government introduce zero credibility for Ruth Davidson. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister can bawl and shout the odds all she wants, but there are legitimate questions to be asked about education under her watch, and I will continue to ask them. And what I don't understand, presiding officer, is that in May, the First Minister accepted that the drop in subject choice needed addressed. I read out her answer just a few months ago. Today, she's saying that to have half of schools offering only six courses at six, uh, S4 seems absolutely fine. But the point here is that the crash in subject choice that we're now seeing is a symptom of a wider malaise, and it is caused by the chaotic introduction of curriculum for excellence. Under this government, we have seen reduced subject choice, we have seen teachers left in the dark, we have seen a higher pass rate falling, we have seen attainment in national exams down by a third compared to the old standard grades, and yet on education this government shows no sign of listening to the evidence, of listening to this parliament or of listening to parents or to teachers. And more must be done before damage is exceeded. So the solution is a complete overhaul of curriculum for excellence. And for once, will this government listen? First Minister. Well, if Ruth Davidson doesn't like me shouting out the evidence, let me repeat it a, a bit more quietly for her. The proportion of pupils getting passes at higher level has increased. Uh, the proportion of pupils getting passes at National 5 level has increased. The numbers of skill-based qualifications being achieved by our young people in schools has doubled since 2012, and we've got a record number of young people uh, going to university. That sounds to me like success that this government is determined to build on. Now turn to Curriculum for Excellence. Curriculum for Excellence has just been lauded and praised uh, by the International Council of Education uh, Advisors. Uh, and Ruth Davidson, week after week, almost stands up here demanding more information 
on the performance of pupils in schools. And yet, yesterday, she and her party performed a breathtaking U-turn and voted against assessments in primary one that she called for, demanded in her manifesto, and has demanded at regular intervals since then. Uh, Ruth Davidson, on issues of education, is a shameless opportunist. Uh, I will leave her to the political opportunism, and I, the Deputy First Minister, and this entire government will go on with delivering for the interests of pupils right across this country. And I think the people of Scotland will notice the difference. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, this government appears to still believe that without the standardised testing of five-year-olds, teachers will not be able to assess our children's learning needs. Scotland's teachers profoundly disagree. Why does the First Minister believe that she knows more about teaching Scotland school children than Scotland school teachers? First Minister. Well, I continue to believe that if we set a benchmark for what we think uh, children in primary one should be achieving in education, uh, then we have a duty to those children, to their parents uh, and to wider society to be able to know whether those children are achieving those benchmarks or not. Uh, that is judged by, by the judgment of teachers, but I think it is right that that is informed uh, by the standardised assessments that we have been uh, talking about. I continue uh, to take that view. As the Deputy First Minister said uh, yesterday, he and we will reflect on Parliament's uh, judgment uh, yesterday and we'll come back with a statement in due course. Uh, but I think there is uh, a mix of opinions uh, amongst uh, teachers. I mean, let me read out, for example, the opinion of Lindsay Watt, who's a former head teacher at Castleview Primary School in Edinburgh, the winner of the Robert Owen Award, which recognises inspirational uh, educators. Uh, that teacher said this, as a teacher of almost 40 years experience, 25 as a head teacher, I'm confused as to why there has been such a furore over primary one pupils undertaking uh, standardised assessments. Various forms of standardised assessments in primary one have been used for many years. The new format is an attempt to unify uh, the process. Uh, they provide an opportunity for schools to access robust additional assessment, providing valuable information to parents about their child's learning journey. I think that is important. I think the opinions of all teachers are important. Uh, but I'm determined that we do raise standards and we close the attainment gap. And the more information we've got to help us to do that, the better. That's my view, and it's a very strong view that I hold. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, last night, this parliament voted decisively to scrap primary one tests. We have a first minister who talks a lot about the will of parliament when it is in the interests of her party. I hope that the first minister will listen to the will of parliament when it is in the interests of Scotland's children. Teachers say, teachers say that these tests are a waste of time. But the, but the government says, but the government says, and we've just heard it again, that it will carry on regardless. The First Minister always accuses others of talking Scotland down. I only wish that she would stop talking down to Scotland's teachers and start valuing them. This week, Scotland's teachers have rejected the government's latest pay offer. If the First Minister won't listen to teachers on primary one testing, will she listen to them on pay? First Minister. Well, we will continue to negotiate uh, on pay through the standard processes. I, I think that is what we would be expected to do and is uh, rightly what we will do. Uh, going back to standardised assessments, I mean, interestingly, Richard Leonard is, is quite selective when it comes to respecting the will uh, of the Scottish Parliament. But, but, but let us focus... But let us focus for just a moment, shall we, on the will of the people in an election. In the 2016 election to this parliament, two thirds of voters who voted in that election voted for manifestos that contained a commitment to standardised assessment in primary one. Now, I don't know whether Richard Leonard thinks that should just be cast aside, uh, but I don't think that should be cast aside. So we will reflect on what uh, parliament said yesterday, and then we will make a judgment based on what we think is right for the interests of young people across Scotland. Uh, our consideration will not be party political opportunism. Our consideration will be the best interests of pupils in Scottish classrooms. Richard Leonard. 
Nicola Sturgeon says that education is the driving and defining priority of her government. It's her record on education that she says she wants to be judged by. So let's look at the record. £400 million cut from school budgets, a testing policy in tatters, a flagship education bill ditched, Scotland's teachers on the verge of strike action. First Minister, if education really is the top priority, why is the government's educational policy in such a mess? First Minister. Well, I'm delighted to be able to share all of this information again with the Chamber. Uh, there are a higher proportion of pupils passing exams in Scotland. More pupils getting hires, more pupils getting National 5 qualifications, more pupils getting skills-based qualifications. The gap between the rich and poor pupils closing. Uh, more young people, including young people from our deprived areas, going to university. I think that is success, and it's success that we are determined to build on. Uh, I have said, and I will say again, that education is our top priority, and we want to be judged on that. But you know what? To be judged on that, it's important to have the information that tells Parliament and tells Scotland whether we are succeeding Absolutely. or not. We've got the information when it comes to exam passes. I want to have that information from the early stages of primary school so that we know we are not letting young people down. We simply should not leave it too late to act and to intervene if young people need extra help. That's why we think assessments in primary one are the right thing to do. And two thirds of the people who voted in the last election agreed with that. And I think that is rather important. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. The West Lothian Courier recently reported on the plight of the Mackenzie family from Breach in the more rural part of my constituency. The family attended St John's Hospital with their sick baby and were transferred eventually after a three-hour wait for an ambulance to the Royal Hospital for sick children because, because the children's ward at St John's remains closed to inpatients. The baby was discharged at 11pm and the family were then left to walk into the city centre to catch the last bus to Livingston to then get a taxi home to Breach, arriving at 1.30am in the morning. All of course contrary to the commitments made by NHS Lothian to provide transport support uh, to local families. So, First Minister, given that baby Kenzie is one of 788 West Lothian children <coughs> to be transferred from St John's to the sick kids, uh, how will you and the government ensure that NHS Lothian and, crucially, the Paediatrics Programme Board do absolutely everything and more to return our much-loved and first-class children's ward to a 24-7 service as soon as possible? First Minister. Well, I can assure Angela Constance that the go government will work uh, closely with NHS Lothian to ensure uh, that the ward is reopened as quickly as possible. The acting chief executive of NHS Lothian uh, assured uh, Jean Freeman on uh, the 28th of August that all efforts are being made to recruit uh, medical staff and advanced enough practitioners to reinstate the inpatient unit. Uh, the current situation, of course, is uh, related to ensuring patient safety, and I don't think any member uh, of this parliament would responsibly suggest uh, that patient safety should not be uh, paramount. Uh, I will ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health to look into the specific case that Angela Constance has raised and keep her and other members with an interest updated on progress in getting the inpatient unit reopened as quickly as possible. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Last week, uh, a full-blown crisis for Shetland's aquaculture and shellfish sectors was only averted at the 11th hour by Northland's ability to charter an extra freight vessel allowing vital time-sensitive shipments to be made. This is also, though, a critical period for Orkney's livestock sector, looking to ship most of its uh, cattle and sheep to the Scottish mainland. As Malcolm Scott from Orkney Mart said to me earlier today, had Northlink not secured the arrow, the potential consequences for farming in Orkney would have been disastrous. Does the First Minister accept that meeting the growing freight needs of linchpin industries in Orkney and Shetland now requires access to a third freight vessel on an ongoing basis? And will she ask her Transport Minister to look seriously and urgently at proposals that have already been made that could increase freight capacity, not just on the Northern Isles routes, but also in West Coast routes, and freeing up potential additional space for passenger traffic as well? 
First Minister. Can I thank Liam McArthur for raising what is an important issue? Uh, yes, I, I do understand uh, the demands that uh, are being made for increased freight capacity. I will certainly ask the Transport uh, Minister to look at the proposals that have been made to brief me on uh, his views on those and uh, to correspond with Liam McArthur about the way forward. But uh, I'm grateful to him for raising uh, the issue and the Transport Secretary will revert to him as soon as possible. And ask Sarwar. Presenting officer, this week we learnt of the third contamination affecting the cancer ward at the Royal Hospital for six children in a short space of time. This has affected drinking water, washing facilities, patients being prescribed antibiotics who are already immunocompromised, patients being transferred to local hospices to get a wash or having to go home, and treatments being delayed. One angry and distressed parent, Donna Louise Hurrell, contacted me directly and she told me that her daughter has now had her chemotherapy delayed on three separate occasions. She asked me to ask directly how many cases of chemotherapy have been delayed due to bacterial and safety concerns affecting the hospital. Can the First Minister please address this directly, but also ask the Cabinet Secretary to instigate an urgent investigation of that hospital to give full answers and full transparency in the interest of those patients, their families and also the wider community and to guarantee that we can minimise the risk of this ever happening again. First Minister. Well, th this situation is deeply regrettable. In terms of uh, the question about numbers of cases, I don't have that information to hand, but I will undertake uh, to ensure that that information is provided to Anis Sarwar. Uh, the primary concern here of the Health Board and indeed of the Scottish Government is the safety and wellbeing of children and their families at the hospital. Uh, we are aware of the new cases that have been linked to this incident and uh, families involved have been kept fully informed and it's right that that uh, continues to happen. Uh, we are liaising closely uh, at the moment with Health Protection Scotland, Health Facilities Scotland. Both of those organisations are supporting NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to ensure that all appropriate steps are in place to manage uh, this incident. While uh, no patients with bacterial infections uh, are currently giving cause for concern, it's very important that all precautions are taken to prevent any further infection. So I will undertake to provide the information that Anna Sarwar asked for, but also ask the Health Secretary to keep, keep him and the Chamber updated on this situation. Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the issues at Air Station Hotel and the severe disruption to rail services south of Air, which is pushing even more traffic onto the already overloaded A77. I wonder if uh, she and her government are aware that there are now plans to close the A77 several times over the next few weeks for urgent resurfacing works, which actually will in effect cut off the South West. Although we don't want the postponement of these surfacing works in the A77, given its appalling state of disrepair, but surely there must be a better plan than this, which takes into account the travel needs of the population in the South West, which includes the replacement bus service and the huge volume of freight traffic using that road. First Minister. Uh, well, I un understand the difficulties that are being posed by the situation at uh, Air Station. Uh, if the member is saying he doesn't think that the resurfacing surfacing work should be postponed, obviously that limits uh, the options. But of course, Transport Scotland and others involved here have to look closely at these decisions to make sure that disruption is being minimised. I know the Transport Secretary will uh, be taking a very close interest in this and I'll happily ask him to correspond with uh, the member about this. We have uh, in previous weeks talked about the situation at Air Central. A uh, proposal was made uh, around car parking spaces, for example, at Presswick Airport, which has been taken forward and we will continue to do whatever we can uh, to minimise the disruption uh, that this situation is causing, including looking at some of the decisions around works to the A77. So uh, I hope that answer is helpful and uh, the Transport Secretary will be happy to provide further information. And Shona Robertson. Does the First Minister uh, share my serious concerns over reports that the UK Government is planning to renege on the Tay Cities deal as reported by the Courier newspaper earlier this week? which would see the UK government reduce its contribution to the deal by a reported £80 million. So will the First Minister agree to raise this matter urgently with the UK government to ensure that they deliver on their part of their, this crucial deal? First Minister. Cities and their regions play a crucial role in driving economic growth, which is why the Scottish Government is working individually and collectively with our cities, regions and the businesses and individuals within them to boost this growth. We know that 
All partners have invested a huge amount of work in their proposals for uh, the Tay City deal and delivering for the regional economy. Uh, and we continue to encourage the UK Government to match Scottish Government investment in the Tay Cities deal. Uh, the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to achieving a heads of term agreement as soon as possible. Uh, we are in a position to proceed right now. Uh, and the situation is that we are waiting for the UK Government to confirm its position. Uh, I hope that happens soon and I hope the commitment uh, of the UK Government is not diminished. Um, I had the privilege of attending the opening of the V&A last uh, Friday, transformational uh, for Dundee, and I think it would be a deep shame if that momentum couldn't continue uh, with the Tay Cities deal being resolved as quickly as possible. So the Scottish Government is ready to go. The question that remains to be answered is the UK Government going to stick to its commitment as well? I hope the answer to that is yes. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hope the First Minister is aware of revelations that have been published by the Ferret and the National that campaigners against fracking are amongst the peaceful, democratic campaigners labelled by Police Scotland as domestic extremists. We've known for years that environmental campaigners, along with peace activists and others, have in the past been spied on or infiltrated by police forces in the UK, including in Scotland. But this statement of current practice is shocking. Anti-fracking campaigners who exercise their democratic right to protest are heroes. Yet Police Scotland is labelling them as domestic extremists. When did the First Minister or her Justice Secretary become aware of this? And what action has the government taken to address it? First Minister. Firstly, I absolutely support the right of peaceful uh, democratic protest. I've taken part in my life in many, many peaceful democratic uh, protests, including uh, at Fasley and against nuclear weapons. Uh, so I will defend uh, the right of people, whether they are protesting against fracking or nuclear weapons or any uh, other issue, as long as they do that peacefully and democratically, uh, then I absolutely defend the right to do so. It's, of course, for the police to answer for operational decisions that they take, but that is my view, uh, and I'm very happy to state that view unequivocally today. Patrick Harvey. I'm afraid we shouldn't accept that this is merely an operational matter. If individuals, campaign groups and communities cannot peacefully campaign on matters, that, issues that matter in our society without being labelled as domestic extremists, and this is the same category used to describe the threat posed by racist and fascist forces in our society, this strikes at the heart of the relationship between policing and the public, and that is clearly a political question. First Minister mentions Faz Lane. This weekend, I'll be joining members of my party as well as those in the SNP, I'm sure in, in Labour and many others as well at Faz Lane, again to protest the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Scotland. Just as people have worked across party lines to oppose blood sports, environmental destruction, asylum evictions and more. The right to do so freely is fundamental to a democratic society. Can the First Minister give an assurance that campaigners at Faz Lane on Saturday will not be designated as domestic extremists merely for attending a peaceful rally? First Minister. Let me give uh, my view. I think if I was to start in this chamber speaking on behalf of Police Scotland, there would be all sorts of justifiable justifiable and legitimate criticisms of me for doing so. However, I am uh, very happy to ask the Chief Constable to address uh, the point uh, on behalf of P Police Scotland that Patrick Harvey has raised. But going back to my view, I do not consider uh, people who protest against nuclear weapons or fracking or anything else in a peaceful and democratic way to be extremists uh, in any sense and would not uh, expect anybody to consider them to be extremists. Patrick Harvey is absolutely right uh, that peaceful protest is a fundamental part of uh, democracy. People should have the right to protest uh, as long as they do so uh, peacefully. Uh, that applies to people who will be at Faz Lane uh, on Saturday. I wish them uh, well. I look forward to the day when there are not uh, nuclear weapons on Scottish soil at Faz Lane and the sooner uh, that day arrives uh, the better. So that applies to people uh, campaigning and protesting against nuclear weapons. It applies to people campaigning or protesting against fracking or any other issue. So that is my very, very firm view and it's one that I hope will have the support of people right across this chamber. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Can I congratulate the First Minister for being so bold and radical this morning? She now wants to delay Brexit by a few weeks. That's definitely going to save us from colossal economic damage. 
Despite going calls for a final say on the deal, the First Minister continues to dither. Does she not understand that we don't just need a delay to Brexit, we need to stop it dead in its tracks? First Minister. Well, firstly, I don't want Scotland to be dragged out of the EU against its will at all. I don't want it to happen in March. I don't want it to happen in April. I don't want it to happen at all. But nothing Willie Rennie has ever said on this issue would give Scotland a guarantee that in future we will not be dragged out of the EU against our will. But let me, let me make an offer uh, to Willie Rennie as somebody who supports the idea of a people's vote. I said again yesterday, uh, the SNP will not stand in the way of that. But if Willie Rennie wants me to be an enthusiastic advocate of that, then let him explain to me how that vote will guarantee that Scotland won't simply find itself in the same position that we find ourselves in in June 2016, where we vote to remain in the EU, but the rest of the UK votes to leave. So I make an offer to Willie Rennie. If he can explain right now how Scotland is guaranteed that it won't find itself in that position, then I'm happy to talk to him further about it. Willie Rennie. The First Minister should be preparing for victory, not defeat. And we'd have a better chance of winning the people's vote Order, please. if we had the Scottish Government on board. Order, please. Every, every day, every day the First Minister dithers gives comfort to those who want a hard Brexit. Being neutral on a people's vote undermines the positive way out of this. Sadiq Khan supports it. Hundreds of Labour delegates want it. Former Conservative ministers back it. Even the Czech Republic and Malta are on board. And the last time I looked, they were small independent countries. Support is building. On Saturday, there's a People's Vote rally in Stirling. There will be an SNP speaker at that rally. Will he be backing the People's Vote campaign, telling them they're wrong or dithering, just like the First Minister? First Minister. Willie Rennie, well, failed to answer the question uh, that I posed, which I thought was quite notable. But Willie Rennie... Oh, Willie Rennie... Oh, dear. Order, Willie please. Rennie said Order, please. Keep it down. Willie Rennie said we should be preparing for victory. Well, I campaigned for victory in the EU referendum in 2016, and I helped to secure a 62% vote to remain in the EU in 2016. And do you know what? It didn't count for anything because the rest of the UK voted to leave. Now, if I'm going to enthusiastically get behind the campaign for another EU vote, then surely it's not unreasonable to ask for guarantees that Scotland will not find itself in that position all over again. And the fact of the matter is, Willie Rennie and others campaigning for a people's vote are unable to give that guarantee. If they are prepared to give it, I'm happy to get behind uh, that campaign. But it seems to me right now that there is only one thing that can stop Scotland uh, having these decisions imposed on it against its will, and that is for Scotland to be in and maybe it's time Willie Rennie started to support that. Thank you. Thank you. We have some, some further supplementaries. The first from Finlay Carson. Thousands of my constituents in Galloway and Western Fries face being bypassed by the digital revolution and be unable to access high-speed broadband services, according to Audit Scotland. Indeed, large parts of Scotland are unlikely to secure super-fast internet speeds by this government's deadline of 2021, with rural communities likely to be hit hardest. 376,000 households are still lacking high speeds, and more than 221,000, including many businesses, will not have access to the network before 2021. Can the First Minister give my constituents a promise that our government will publish a clear timetable for R100 by the summer of 2019? Or will this yet again be an example of this SNP's government habit of making big announcements and then two or three years down the line, 
failing to deliver. Would members please, would members please allow other idea. members to ask a question? Might First Minister. Good idea for the member to have actually read the Audit Scotland report <laughs> before coming to this chamber uh, today. Let me give him uh, some snippets forward. Let me start actually with uh, what Fraser uh, McKinley from Audit Scotland said on uh, Good Morning Scotland uh, this very day. He said, and I'm quoting, the good news is that the Scottish Government has achieved its target to provide access to fibre broadband to 95% of homes and businesses across Scotland by the end of last year, and they did that well. Uh, or we could take page five of the report. Higher than expected take up and lower than expected costs mean uh, 60,300 additional premises will gain access to the fibre network at no extra cost to the public sector. Or page eight of the report, by the end of 2017, 95% of premises in Scotland had access to fibre broadband. Only around two thirds of premises in Scotland would have access without public sector investment. On the 100% commitment and let's uh, remember that that 100% commitment both in terms of coverage and broadband speeds will take us ahead of any other part of the UK. Fraser McKinley when asked this specific question uh, this morning said we are definitely not saying that won't be achieved by 2021. Uh, we are investing £600 million pounds in the R100 procurement uh, programme. The procurement will be let uh, next year. And just uh, as a final point, presiding officer, uh, the Scottish Government is uh, investing £600 million. Pounds. But despite this being a reserved matter, yeah. the UK yeah. Government is investing just £21 million. Pounds. A mere 3% okay. of the total. Okay. So why don't you take it up with your own Tory colleagues in Westminster before you come lecturing the Scottish Government on a programme that we are delivering and according to Audit Scotland, delivering well. Officer, last night the Prime Minister told EU leaders she's put forward serious proposals on Brexit, but all that's on the table is a no deal or a blind Brexit, both of which would seriously damage Scotland's interests. Does the First Minister think that these are really serious proposals or just seriously misguided? First Minister. Well, Bre Brexit is a mistake and the handling of Brexit by the UK government is a complete and utter shambles. I mean, Chequers is, and I'm quoting, I think, a Tory MP uh, just this morning when I say this, Chequers is as dead as a dodo. Uh, and although the Prime Minister wants to frame the choice that's coming later this year as one between No Deal and Chequers, it is increasingly likely that that choice is going to be between no deal uh, or a no detail deal uh, where the, the future statement about the relationship after uh, Brexit has no detail, is vague and nobody will know what comes after EU membership. And I think it would be reckless in the extreme uh, for the UK to take a step off the Brexit cliff edge, effectively wearing a blindfold with no idea where it's going to land. In those circumstances, it would be far better and far more responsible to extend Article 50 so that all of the alternatives uh, can be uh, properly looked at. But I think it's long past the case where we can expect uh, sensible approaches from this uh, government. Uh, they are intent, uh, this UK Tory government is intent on recklessly uh, taking the whole country off the Brexit cliff edge. Uh, and I think future generations will judge them extremely harshly for that. And Jenny Mara. Can I add my voice to the calls to break the deadlock over the Tay Cities deal, presiding officer? The First Minister knows that as part of Dundee's regeneration and our superb new v &A, that the city is bidding for decommissioning work to create good jobs. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber why she will not publish the EY report, which details why Dundee didn't get decommissioning investment in her programme for government, so Dundee can better understand her government's analysis of this economic opportunity? First Minister. Well, I'll come back to her on the issue of the EY report. We remain uh, committed to securing jobs and decommissioning in a whole range uh, of other areas for uh, Dundee. I think uh, right now, uh, assuming the UK government stops dragging its feet over the Tay Cities deal, there is every reason to be really optimistic about the future uh, of 
Dundee. Of course, the Scottish Government was the principal funder uh, of the V&A that I know she uh, attended the opening of on Friday as well. But of course, uh, we've also put the headquarters of the new Social Security Agency in Dundee, delivering hundreds of jobs in the city of Dundee. So this is a government, whether it's the Social Security Agency, whether it's uh, our support for the V&A, whether it's our continued support for jobs in a whole host of uh, other areas. This is a government that's full square behind Dundee and we will continue to be so. Question number five, Alistair Allen. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government will use the Social Metrics Commission's new framework for tackling poverty. First Minister. We welcome the work of the Social Metrics Commission to further develop our understanding of poverty. I note the Commission states that the UK Government political debate has focused on the measurement of poverty rather than the action needed to drive better outcomes and it calls for, uh, I'm quoting, energy into creating pathways out of poverty. Of course, the opposite is the case for this Government where we are committed uh, to action having already set our statutory targets. Uh, of course, the UK Government have scrapped their child poverty targets, scrapped their poverty unit and scrapped the Child Poverty Commission. Uh, they're also presiding over the disastrous rollout of universal credit and welfare cuts that will see more children pushed into poverty. Uh, this government, by contrast, is focused on actions that will reduce child poverty and tackle deep-seated inequalities. Alistair Allen. I thank the First Minister for that answer. On child poverty specifically, the report shows that Scotland does better in working to address this than the rest of the UK does. Isn't it the case, however, that while Scotland lacks full powers over employment laws and social security, we are tackling these problems with one hand tied behind our back in the face of even deeper cuts to welfare from a visibly uncaring UK government. First Minister. Uh, yes, that is absolutely uh, right. While we work to try to lift children out of poverty, UK government welfare policy in particular is actively pushing families and children into poverty. You know, there are independent reports that show that more than one in three children could be living in poverty by 2030. That is squarely due to UK welfare cuts, which uh, by 2020 will amount to almost four billion pounds a year for Scotland. Uh, while the UK government is ignoring child poverty, we're getting on with tackling inequalities and taking action to meet our child poverty targets. In March, we published Every Child, Every Chance, which is our four-year programme of action to reduce child poverty. Since then, we've announced the early introduction of Best Start grant payments, uh, the new minimum school clothing grant of £100, uh, all of which provides crucial help for parents. But there is no doubt whatsoever that with more powers over welfare, we could do so much more. And of course, an independent Scotland could do so much better. Question number six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update uh, on the Scottish breast screening programme in light of reports that many women were not contacted for their final checkup. First Minister. A, a review of the Scottish breast screening programme by the Scottish Clinical Task Force identified 1,761 women aged over 70 who were not invited for their final breast screening appointment. I can tell the Chamber that all of those women have now been sent a letter advising them of what has happened and offering an opportunity to attend for breast screening. All women affected who wish to have a breast screen will receive an appointment for screening before the end of October this year. Uh, we will ensure that any additional screening will not displace other women due for their screening appointment. Uh, work has also been taken forward to develop an IT fix to address this specific issue going forward. Arrangements are in place to manually identify any women who may have been missed for this reason until that IT fix is in place. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that update? Uh, but it does miss, miss a, a very crucial fact, and that's that this was actually predictable. Because in 2016, a review by Healthcare Improvement Scotland found that uh, nearly 4,000 women had not been sent screening invitations. And as a result, it made a number of recommendations, one of which was better oversight of that IT system. In May this year, the former Health Secretary told this chamber that, and I quote, I want to reassure members of the public that this issue does not affect the NHS in Scotland and patients should be reassured that there are no problems with the programme records or the IT system. So can I ask the First Minister, why was the 2016 recommendation uh, ignored and what reassurances can she give today that the screening programme IT system is and will be fit for purpose? First Minister. Well, firstly, in, in relation to the 
2016 issue, my understanding is this is uh, a separate issue uh, and therefore I'm not sure it is accurate to say that this was, uh, to use uh, the word that was used, predictable. In terms of the situation around the English breast screening uh, programme, the former Health Secretary uh, sought and received assurances at that time that that issue was not being repeated in Scotland. However, Shona Robertson rightly requested further due diligence checks. The clinical task force was established to support Public Health England in identifying and contacting any woman affected who was now uh, living in Scotland. Uh, that task force also carried out a wider review and uh, the issue that we're talking about today was an unrelated and separate issue. Uh, and it was as a result of that issue that we discovered uh, that the 1,761 women uh, had not been invited for the final screening uh, appointment. Now, I would take this opportunity to apologise to each and every one of these uh, women. That should not have happened. Uh, but uh, I think it is important to put in context, although of course it, it doesn't reduce the anxiety for any of these individual women, but it is around 0.2% uh, of the approximately uh, 700,000 women who are eligible for breast screening in Scotland and invited every uh, three years. So it's because of the action that the previous Health Secretary took at the time of the announcement in England uh, that this issue came to light. As I said in my original answer, all women are now being offered appointments for screening uh, and an IT fix is being put in place to ensure uh, that this does not happen in the future. And I hope uh, that answer gives some comfort uh, to the women uh, who did miss their final screening appointment, but also uh, to the wider population of women uh, who go for breast screening. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll turn now to, or in a moment, to members' business in the name of Lee MacArthur on Scotland's marine energy industry. But we'll first of all have a short suspension to allow uh, members and members of the public to leave the gallery and for uh, new members to arrive. A short suspension. <laughs>